Good afternoon and welcome to today's Made by McGill alumni webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement, and it's Tuesday, November 8th, 2022. Those of you who tune in regularly to this series are no doubt aware that we've used this forum to cover some of the most pressing issues and challenging topics of our times, from the COVID-19 pandemic to the war in Ukraine to the climate change crisis. Today, we're going to take a step back from the front page headlines and turn to a topic that has occupied a great deal of my time for as long as I can remember, spiders, or as the title of today's webcast suggests, a tale of fear, loathing, and fascination. Let me begin with a confession. I am ghastly afraid of spiders. They frighten me to the point of paralysis. If there were a support group for Arachnophobia Anonymous, I would be a charter member. So when I landed on a story in the New York Times this past summer that examined the role that media distortions might play in how and why we misunderstand spiders, I was fascinated and then thrilled to discover that the first person quoted in the article was a postdoctoral fellow right here at McGill. So I wrote to her. And here we are just a few weeks later, and I'm thrilled to welcome Catherine Scott to our first ever alumni webcast on the subject of spiders and arachnophobia. Catherine is a postdoctoral fellow at the Lyman Laboratory on McGill's McDonald campus, a natural historian and a behavioral ecologist who specializes in spiders. And joining her on today's panel is Anna Weinberg, an associate professor in McGill's Department of Psychology and Canada Research Chair in Clinical Neuroscience. Professor Weinberg studies the biological and neural pathways linked to emotional experiences, including anxiety, depression, and irrational fears. So if I'm ever going to have a fighting chance to get over my fear of spiders, it might as well start in the company of these two talented professionals. Before we jump into this creepy conversation, a reminder that if you are watching live today and have questions for either of our panelists or words of encouragement for me, you can send them to us by email at aoc at mcgill.ca and we'll do our best to address them to our guests. So welcome both of you. Catherine, let's begin with you. Uh, in terms of the study that triggered today's conversation, what exactly were scientists trying to understand about our relationship with spiders? And what were some of the key takeaways that emerged from this research? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. So um, the, the main impetus for this study was um, essentially a big group of arachnologists. Well, it started with a few of us, and then we got together um, a global team of about 80 colleagues from all over the world, um, all of whom are, are, we love spiders, we study them for a living, um, and we are often frustrated by the way that they're portrayed in the media. You know, my parents are always sending me emails whenever they see an article about a spider in the newspaper, and it's almost always negative. And we're always so frustrated. Um, it's like that meme you might be familiar with of, you know, someone is wrong on the internet, and so you have to go and, and correct them. Arachnologists get that a lot because a lot of the, of the things that people think they know about spiders and a lot of things that end up in news stories about spiders tend to be quite sensationalistic and often incorrect. But we wanted to know, is that just our impression? Are we just, um, do we think that it's worse than it is? We wanted to find out exactly how good or bad uh, the media representation of spiders is um, and collect data that might help us to understand why and to combat it. And so this team of, of arachnologists, we got together and we read a whole lot of news articles about spiders um, in about 40 different languages and compiled all the data. And um, the, the first takeaway is that almost half of the articles that we looked at had errors in them. Um, some were small, some were big, but 50% had you know factual errors and 43% were sensationalistic. And so that's not very good. That suggests that a lot of the information that people are getting about spiders from the news media is, is either incorrect or sensationalized when it really doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. Well, very interesting. Um, so before we turn to uh, Professor Weinberg, because I want to bring her in to talk about you know phobias and, and how this might relate to all that, I do have to ask you one question. Um, so I picked up the New York Times this summer and saw this article and, and wow, there you were right in it. So how did that come about that you ended up in the New York Times? And what was that like to see your name in print associated with this study in such a prestigious newspaper? Uh, well, the the publication, the, the journal that published our study was um, 
one that is fairly general. So, so it's one that kind of, they, they, articles in these, these journals get sent around to journalists and, you know, they may or may not pick them up. Um, I think that part of this is, you know, A, stories about spiders are always kind of intriguing to people. Um, and so a journalist saw this and thought, hey, I want to write about it. Also, I think it was of interest um, to journalists because it's kind of about them <laughs> and, and how good mm -hmm. they are at reporting on these things. And uh, so I had an interesting conversation with the journalist at the New York Times who actually, they asked me to go look and see about whether we had New York Times articles in our database and how they had done. And I'm happy to report that the New York Times articles that we scored um, did not contain errors or sensation. Mm. So they're doing quite well. Um, and I will say like, I've, I've written a lot of peer reviewed publications. Not very many people read them. Um, <laughs> It's it's exciting to be to be in a newspaper like this where lots of people read it and um, you know this is the first time I think that my father has actually read something about my research because he subscribes to the New York Times so yeah <laughs> well very very exciting and, and thrilling nonetheless for sure um, so let's bring in Professor Weinberg and, and thank you uh, for for joining us today I, I can't imagine what your initial reaction might have been when I reached out to you initially and invited you to join a panel about spiders, uh, but you graciously accepted the offer, so thank you. Um, so now that you're here, can you outline for us, how does the neuroscientific community, what is its view of phobias? And what do we know about the biology and mechanisms of our brains that might explain some of these fears? Yeah, yeah but thank you for having me, Derek. Um, and I, I also want to make sure that it's clear that I'm I'm not here as the uh, pro misinformation side. I hope <laughs> um, I you know I believe in factuality and reporting. Um, but you know I think that there are you know what you're asking about is a related but slightly separate issue, right? Is how why are people afraid of spiders? And um, when we think about uh, you know what what our brains kind of have evolved to do, so so we are. Uh, as living organisms in the world, exquisitely attuned to threat, signals of threat and signals of potential reward, right? These are the things that keep us alive, allow us to navigate like a very complex and changing environment. And so, you know, we have to um, have mechanisms in place to rapidly detect signals of threat so that we can respond appropriately. And when we think about, you know, what that means, um, you know, it, it's much more costly at the individual level to not respond to something that is potentially threatening than it is to, you know, respond to something that actually is not threatening, right? So if we're thinking about how, you know, most spiders are not poisonous, I assume that's right, Catherine, most of them are not? <laughs> most of them are, are harmless to humans, yeah. Most of them are harmless to humans. However, they perceptually resemble ones that are potentially really dangerous to humans. And so that, you know, the, if we think about what fear is for, fear is for motivating us to, to act, to, to keep ourselves safe. So there is a bias to respond to things that look like things that are really dangerous as though they are dangerous because it would be catastrophic not to in the few cases in which they are actually dangerous. So, and we, and we see this a lot, you know, with, with lots of different fears. Um, so we see this with snakes, certainly, um, you know, anything that kind of wiggles in that way um, and heights like these are these are things that we have in theory evolved over time to to fear um, and, and, you know, using these kind of same mechanisms that I was just talking about. Mm -hmm. So but I was reading somewhere that, you know, if they look at the world population, there's something like it was like three and a half to 11 percent of the world population has arachnophobia, which I think is deemed to be one of the most common phobias. So yeah. why is it that someone like myself, who's you know, a fairly rational, normal, you know, semi-intelligent individual, why would I associate that spider that may look like something terrible and associate that with a fear, whereas, you know, 90% of the population is totally fine and, and views them as being harmless? Is something, am I wired differently? Yeah. So I probably, you know, I, I would bet that the 90% of the population does not uh, habitually view all spiders as uh, harmless. I mean, and, and you know, ninety percent of the population would be wrong in that. But I think that you know, ninety percent of the population would think I'm going to at least be cautious around this spider. Um, and you know, it, phobias certainly are not for lack of intelligence or rationality. Um, so, so you know, people will develop more pathological levels of fear because of 
early adverse experiences that they may have had with something that they're afraid of. Um, they may mm -hmm. see modeling. So you can acquire phobias through watching someone else respond very strongly to a stimulus like a spider. So there, there's lots of different ways that you can mm -hmm. acquire these fears. But then, you know, what we talk about in, in my field is those fears are then maintained through avoidance. So the reason that that fear stays so strong, even if a spider is not dangerous, is because people avoid them and they never learn anything new about the spider, right? So if every time you see a spider, you run screaming out of the room, you're never going to learn that that spider is safe. Right. Okay. So I want to get to that, that question in a minute. Let me ask you this question for, for both panels. Has anyone on this call ever been in a car accident because of a spider? Maybe just raise your hand. Because of a spider? No. <laughs> see, I, see, I'm the only one, right? <laughs> it was a fender bender, but still, I mean, it's that extreme. So so let me ask you, Professor Weinberg, I'll get to the most basic question of all, at least for, for me and other fellow arachnophobes. Can someone be cured of a phobia like arachnophobia? And what would a treatment plan look like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's actually, um, you know, one of the things that when we were training, we were taught you could do this in a day if you have a patient who's um, sufficiently committed to the process. But uh, the process is extremely unpleasant, necessarily so. So, you know, you really do have to be committed to it. And so what we do is something called exposure therapy. Um, and you typically do it in a kind of graded way. So you start maybe by just looking at pictures of spiders together. And you spend a long time looking at them, investigating every visual detail. And the idea is that by exposing yourself to that stimulus that you're so afraid of, but then not avoiding, not running away, you're learning new information. So you're encoding new things about this thing that you perceive to be so threatening. And then you graduate. After you get sick of looking at the spiders, you're not at all upset anymore. You graduate to the next thing until you, know, you get to the top of our ladder where you have spiders in your hands or on your head. <laughs> Uh, okay, my skin is crawling. So let, let's start <laughs> exposure therapy right now. Catherine, that thing behind your right shoulder, that's not a clock, is it? <laughs> yeah, this, this is an actual um, molt. So spiders, in order to grow, they shed their skins. And so this is, is not the actual spider itself, but it's old skin that it has shed. Uh, and my friend has has very beautifully mounted it for me. So this is a tarantula. And um, I will say I know of at least one um, very successful spider exposure therapy. I think it's associated with the London Zoo. And, and they do this where people come in in an afternoon and they are cured of their phobia. And by the end of the session, they are holding a tarantula in, in their hand. It's It's quite amazing. Wow. Um, and I presume that that I know it's just skin, but that's behind bulletproof glass, right? <laughs> <laughs> just to it be is sure. behind glass, yes. Although okay. I do have a live tarantula next to me on, on my desk as well, that maybe by the end of the call, you'll feel comfortable with me holding in my hand and showing you. Uh, oh, it could be, could be. And I know we're also going to show later a few photos that you sent us from, from your field work as well. But let me uh, stick with you, Catherine, for a minute. Um, and just to pick up on Professor Weinberg's notion of exposure therapy. And one of the interesting things I noted in reviewing the study that, that you were involved in, uh, Catherine, was that misinformation and in particularly sensation, sensational stories about spiders appear to occur much more frequently in countries where encounters with dangerous spiders are rare, such as the United States or the UK. Whereas I think the study found that, you know, people in countries where there actually may be a real threat of exposure to venomous spiders, such as Australia, for instance, seem to cope better with their spider population. So can we conclude that this is a case of exposure therapy taking place at sort of a, a community or a society level? I mean, I'm I'm not quite sure about that's more of a question for for the psychologist on the call. But I think what's going on here in large part is that, you know, in the UK, there are no spiders that are what we call medically important. There, there are no spiders that are that are native to the UK that can really make a human very sick. Um, and the UK news is the worst for sensationalism, for overblowing things and for, you know, closing down schools because there are spiders in them that people are afraid of. Um, so I think that that you may be onto something and, and coming back to what we heard before about, you know, some spiders are a threat. And so recognizing that is important for us as, as organisms. Um, I think maybe in Australia that has many more species that could potentially harm a human or even, even kill you in, in the worst case scenario, although that's very, very rare. Um, I don't know if Australians are 
encountering spiders more often than we are because there are spiders everywhere. There's probably a spider in the room you're sitting in right now. A study uh, that my colleagues did of, called Arthropods of the Great Indoors found that uh, every home that they surveyed had spiders inside and almost every single room in every home had at least one spider in it. So they're everywhere. You probably don't notice them or, and if, but if you do, you know, they're, they're around. Uh, Australia does have some bigger spiders that people might see more often, but I think also people in Australia know more about spiders. There's more um, good public health information about spiders. So they have that knowledge about uh, which spiders to be concerned about and, and recognizing that, you know, when I see a redback spider, that's one that I teach my kids not to touch and things like that because it could make them sick. Whereas in North America, we don't have that messaging. We really don't need to worry about it. But when we hear about um, about spiders, we we have less information, I think, to go on and and more sort of myths and and things that we've seen in movies and things and our imaginations kind of run wild. We don't have that. Um, that baseline information about what is and is not a threat. Right. So hold that thought about myths, because I do want to come back to that. But let me bring Professor Weinberg back in here, because I think it's an interesting point, this notion of sort of community exposure therapy, if you want to call it that. I'm wondering, Professor Weinberg, is, is, is there a correlation between fear and lack of exposure sort of at the individual level? So in other words, it feels like sometimes we fear the things that are least likely to cause us harm. And I'm wondering why our brains can't process these odds in a sort of rational way that this little itty bitty spider is not actually going to cause any harm to me. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question. I, you know, it, it's not <clears throat> it's not always the case that we fear the things that are least likely to cause us harm, but it is definitely the case that the things that we fear the most, particularly in the case of phobias, are not necessarily dangerous. So, like, if we're thinking about the Australia example that you were just giving, right? Mm -hmm. We would never want to do exposure to, um, you know, handling extremely dangerous poisonous spiders. Like if that's, you should be afraid of those spiders. Don't like leave them alone. Um, we're, you know, we do exposure therapy when people's fears are so much more exaggerated than the danger that something actually poses to them, right? So, mm -hmm. so in this case, so the common household spider that we apparently are all living with right now, yeah, that's a great candidate for exposure therapy. And and one of the reasons that absolutely you can see an association between lack of exposure and fear is because people run away, right? People select themselves out of situations when they could be exposed to these animals, to spiders, because they're so afraid. So they don't learn anything new about them. They don't learn that they're not, they're not dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of like how this is would develop, there's, there's a lot of of theories of that. So one is the evolutionary preparedness idea that there are some things that we are well equipped to acquire fears about so that it is easier to teach someone to be afraid of some things than it is to other things. So it's easier to teach people to be afraid of spiders than it is to teach them to be afraid of flowers, for example. Um, more people certainly in North America die from touching electrical outlets every day than they do from spider bites, but we tend not to have a lot of phobias of electrical sockets, uh, at least presenting in the clinic. And, and that's in part because of um, this you know, evolutionary preparedness, but also probably in part because of a, an inoculating effect that we all use electrical sockets every day. We have to, right? So every time you plug something in, you get some exposure so you're learning something about the safety. And so there is an idea of fear inoculation, the idea that if you have more experiences that are benign with something that is potentially um, phobogenic, then you're less likely to develop a phobia with about that, even if you have a very bad experience, even if you get shocked by an electrical socket. Right. And I'm just sorry, coping with the fact that I'm in a room right now, probably full of <laughs> spiders and electrical outlets. So <laughs> this is really dangerous right now. Um, just a, a reminder for anyone watching live, if you do have any questions for Catherine or for Professor Weinberg, uh, you can send them to us by email at aoc at mcgill.ca. That's aoc at mcgill.ca. So Professor Weinberg, let me just stick with you for a minute. You, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know when you deal with, with people with phobias in, in, your, in your clinic, in your professional work, is there any evidence suggesting you know where these phobias come from can, you know, I know there's this sort of, 
you know, idea that, well, it must have been something that occurred early in your childhood and it scarred you for life. You may not even remember it, but there's some sort of trace. Is that is that correct or is that just one of many possibilities? It, uh, so as with every uh, psychology story, it's one of many possibilities. So there's there's lots of different pathways to to phobias, for example. So something like 50 percent of people who, you know, who meet criteria for a, a phobia can report that early in their life or, you know, even even in adulthood, they did encounter the thing that they're afraid of and something terrible happened associated with it. Right. Um, so, they, you know, they were bitten by a dog or um, a shark. Um, but 50 percent don't have those experiences. And, you know, what we know about memory is these these very traumatic events, these very powerful events, we tend not to forget those. So if it was something powerful enough to kind of, you know, generate a, a phobia, then we're unlikely. It's not impossible, but we're unlikely to just forget those things. Um, so that alone, early experiences, that that alone doesn't seem to explain the development of phobias. Mm -hmm. Could it be genetic based? Like, can I just blame my parents who I think are watching right now? Can I just, yeah, is it absolutely. their fault? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, so there is evidence for um, heritability of um, fearful tendencies and anxiety. So, you know, we, we do know that running families, um, identical twins look more alike on measures of fearfulness and phobias than non-identical twins. Certainly there is a genetic component, but, you know, most of us are also raised by the people who give us our genes. So there's also an environmental component. So our parents also teach us, you know, whether what we need to be afraid of and what we need to watch out for. So my kids are in um, an unfortunate kind of push me, pull you situation where I tend to be, I'm not phobic. I can, you know, but I, I tend to be a little squeamish about spiders. Um, and my husband, uh, <laughs> some of us call it excessively tolerant of spiders in the home. So we've had a lot of battles about how many spiders and how big they're allowed to be uh, inside the house. Um, so we are giving both of those messages to our kids. Um, and they also have, you know, my genes in there mixing with his genes. Um, and it, unfortunately, this is not my aim. It looks like fear is winning out uh, for my mm -hmm. kids at the moment. Right. Well, I can I can understand why that would be the case. Yeah. But um, although I guess having a household with, with two spouses where you've got one who's afraid of spiders and one who can handle them, which is my setup as well, just the, the reverse order, um, I think is probably good for uh, good for everybody. So, um, so Catherine, from your perspective, I mean, thinking back to the study, I mean, would you suggest that the media really does have a role to play in perhaps exacerbating some of these phobias around spiders? I think so. Um, and that's one thing that we we intend to look at. We have this huge data set and we we want to do more to kind of look into cultural differences, dig into, into the data, you know, on a country by country level. And we, we also collected other sort of variables um, at the country level to, to sort of dig into how, how broadly cultural differences might play into the, the information we got based on spiders in the news media. But I definitely think that that mythology and, and popular culture have a big role to play. Um, you know, if you think about scary movies, um, even, even not scary movies, but like The Lord of the Rings, mind a famous spider right spiders are often villains you've got arachnophobia uh you've got shelob the spider in lord of the rings the only positive spider representation that i can think of at least sort of in in recent pop culture is uh charlotte from charlotte's web mm -hmm. but there are far more negative portrayals of spiders than there are positive ones and um i certainly think that plays a role in in how they're portrayed and sort of this general association with spiders, with spookiness, with Halloween uh, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, you, you essentially <laughs> answered most of my next question, but I wanted to delve a little bit more into that uh, with both of you, the sort of role that culture and mythology and pop culture, I guess, plays in all this. So as I was preparing for this webcast and thinking through about my own, I guess some would say irrational fear of spiders, I was comparing it to bears as, as an example. I mean, bears are something that are sort of beloved in our, in our culture. We have, you know, a whole teddy bear industry. We've got Yogi Bear, you know, Winnie the Pooh. Um, and yet, and people sort of just have this real affinity towards bears. And yet a bear will, you know, maul you to death if it had an opportunity, if it felt threatened. Um, whereas spiders seem to be 
uh, sort of scapegoated as scary creatures, particularly around Halloween and, and other uh, other events. So, so would you argue that you know the way society portrays certain animals um, might end up hurting the spider in our in our minds? I, I certainly think that that's the case. I mean, you you see um, horrible stories about you know families and and people going up to try to pet wild animals that that they have um, have seen you know in a positive light, and people think like oh bears are cute and cuddly, uh, and that that can lead to disaster. Uh, you don't see people going out and um, and interacting with spiders, with one exception. Or there was a really interesting news story. So Spider Man is kind of a positive representation of of spiders in pop culture, mm -hmm. although he does get bitten by the spider at the beginning. Uh, so there was a story in the news uh, about two little boys who actually mm -hmm. encountered a black widow and had it bite them, like they made it bite them on purpose, wanting to get super spider superpowers like Spider Man. Um, but that's the only example of, of that that I'm aware of, of sort of people seeking out spiders. Um, they ended up being okay. They had to go to the hospital. They got treated and they were fine. Uh, no one in, in decades has died from a Black Widow bite because we have good um, medical care. We have antivenin. Uh, so even, even though they're capable of killing people, nobody really dies of, of bites anymore. And you really do have to be trying quite hard to get bitten. I do want to make that point as well. Spiders aren't out there trying to get you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Professor Weinberg, I'm curious, you know, from the neuroscientist perspective, um, what do you make of the sort of role of culture in this debate around, you know, what triggers phobia? So can cultural norms actually alter the mechanisms in our brain to the point where we'll find, you know, a cuddly kinship to animals that could kill us um, and yet live in abject fear of, you know, the miscast spider? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, you know, our, our brains exist in society. So, you know, there, there is uh, too much, there are very, very few things, let us say, that are genetically hardwired, right? You know, our brains are very plastic. They change throughout our lifetimes and in accordance with the, the experiences that we have with the people around us and the culture around us. So, so culture plays a huge role in how people's brains function. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, just kind of going back to the question that you were asking Catherine, like, um, you know, I treat phobias, which is when fear gets pathological and fear interferes mm -hmm. with people's lives. So the people are no longer living lives they value, that they would want to live. Um, but I'm a huge fan of fear. And fear is fear is a great thing for us. So people, yes, people should be afraid of petting wild animals. Um, I, I have no problem with, <laughs> with making sure that people have a healthy respect for things that are actually very dangerous. Um, and, you know, perhaps <laughs> educating people around... Uh, the reality of the Spider-Man situation is also really important. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm not super well versed in the history of the teddy bear, but from my understanding, you know, that that's a relatively recent invention. I believe people had a healthier uh, fear or at least respect <laughs> for bears prior to the introduction of the teddy bear, which um, <laughs> did a lot <laughs> for the reputation. Um, but I think it was because of Teddy Roosevelt, right? Because he hunted them so vociferously that that uh then you know they they made this little stuffed animal in his honor but but right we you know absolutely culture does shape how we think about things and that is reflected in how the brain responds to things of course mm -hmm. um and sometimes it does it in ways that are helpful for us and sometimes it does it in ways that are less helpful for us Right. Well, it's an interesting, uh, interesting way to look at it. Um, just a reminder, again, if you're watching live uh, and you want to send a question to our panelists, you can email us at aoc at mcgill.ca. We just did receive a question. I'll get to that in a minute. Catherine, I want to come back to you for a minute. Um, and this is interesting. I've, I've held this piece of information back for, for almost 30 minutes now. But probably the thing that I've come to learn about you these last few weeks that has left me the most dumbfounded, <laughs> but certainly very curious is that you yourself were once afraid of spiders, perhaps, you know, at the same level I was, there's arachnophobia. So I'm curious, how did you get over your fear and, and go from arachnophobia to arachnid lover? Yeah, so I, I was much like you, terrified of spiders for most of my life, up until I was about 25 years old. So when I was a kid, if I saw a spider in my room, I would run out the door. Uh, I, I would run, I would scream, and my mother would very calmly, you know, come and pick up the spider and relocate it. So I, I definitely didn't learn it from her, um, but I certainly remember 
horror stories, be, hearing as a child about spiders that would lay, lay their eggs under your skin um, or be in your hair and these kind of urban myths that, that terrified me, that I probably heard from friends at school and I probably had teachers who, who reacted poorly to spiders and so on. Uh, so I was, I, I had never looked closely at a spider until I was in my mid twenties. Um, and it was at that point that I was uh, in an undergraduate invertebrate zoology class. We actually had a professor, this was at Simon Fraser University and the professor was arachnophobic. So we skipped spiders. <laughs> in that class. Um, and actually, fun side note. So I, I'm an arachnologist. My partner is an entomologist. We love creepy crawlies. Even entomologists, so people who study insects, animals with six, six legs for a living, a huge proportion of them are afraid of spiders. There's something about that extra pair of legs. And again, this sort of this preparedness um, idea makes a lot of sense to me because I once had an entomologist walk out of the room before my presentation at a conference and they apologized to me, but they said, I can't look at a picture of a spider and they study insects. Um, all that's to say, we skipped spiders in, in my invertebrate zoology class, but I had a TA who brought spiders into the laboratory. And then at the end of the semester told us that she was hiring a summer research assistant to help her on her work on the vibratory communication of black widow spiders. And I was really wanting to go to graduate school to, to study biology and do research. And this seemed like a really good opportunity to get research experience in a laboratory. Uh, and I had a good relationship with this TA and thought that I would apply for the job. And I actually had something to offer because I had in a previous life studied mathematics and um, and engineering, and I had taken courses on vibrations and signaling. So I kind of had some background information that might help with this project. And so I applied and I just, I, I'm a sort of, I'm also afraid of heights, but was forced as a child to climb up the ladder and put up uh, Christmas lights on our house because both my my dad and my older brother was were also afraid of spiders so they were afraid of heights so they made me do it so I developed this ability as a child to to force myself to to face fears head on and so I said I can do this I will if I get this job I will just have to figure out how to get over my fear of spiders because it's such a great opportunity and it had never occurred to me before seeing that job ad that spiders communicate that spiders sort of have these, you know, individual lives that they they talk to each other, that they do interesting things because I had never looked at them. I had never thought about them other than in fear and disgust. Uh, long story short, I, I got the job and I almost immediately fell in love with spiders as soon as I started learning about them, as soon as I, I, I guess I sort of subjected myself to exposure therapy, you know, going into the lab on day one, looking at black widows and just deciding that I would face them. And then I, and then I made an effort to read everything I could about spiders to help me with my research. Um, and through learning about their behavior, their communication, and all the fascinating things that they do, I learned that they can be beautiful. They have really incredible um, behavior and social systems and do all kinds of wonderful things. And I very quickly shifted to an arachnophile and also wanted to tell everyone else uh, how interesting spiders are. And I should say also, one of the things that I learned right away early on was that spiders aren't actually as dangerous as I thought they were. And so it's sort of like one of the first things that I asked my supervisor, the PhD student I was working with was like, oh, so black widows, you know, aren't they dangerous? And she explained to me, well, yes, but, um, you know, they, they can make you really sick, but I handle them, you know, every day for my research and I don't get bitten because that's just not something that spiders do. They don't feed on humans. They don't have any interest in biting humans. And that little bit of information was, was key for me to realize, okay, so there isn't an immediate threat and I can learn more and, um, yeah, the rest is history. Wow, that's pretty fascinating, actually. It maybe offers a bit of hope to me. Professor Weinberg, when you hear this story from a psychologist's perspective, is this sort of like the, the textbook case of 
how one should get over their fear of whatever the phobia might be? Yeah, well, I mean, the, all of the elements of like a cognitive behavioral approach to to treating phobias are uh, are there. I, I, what I couldn't tell is if you did, if you just kind of plunged right in, um, or if you actually took kind of this graded hierarchical approach. Um, were you handling spiders day one, Catherine? Pretty close to, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we would call that flooding. Um, that's typically not <laughs> recommended uh, for most people with a pretty severe phobia, but you know, I mean, we really define phobia as someone who's having problems functioning in their daily life as a, is a part of their, their fear, right? So, so Catherine like had a strong fear of spiders, but it doesn't sound like it was actually interfering with her ability to, to live her life. So um, flooding is, is, you know, what it sounds like. So it's Indiana Jones being dropped into the pit of snakes, right? Like it's, it's when you don't start small, you don't look at pictures of spiders. You just go right into like, you know, your face is covered in spiders. Um, which is again, wow. not typically recommended. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so, so, you know, what she did was um, she took the time to interact with spiders and to learn. Uh, and you did these little behavioral experiments, presumably following the, the, the woman that you were explaining that you worked with. Right. And these are the behavioral experiences that we really encourage clients to have as well. Like just be curious about it, try to find out some more information. So if you have a spider on your hand, how often is it going to bite you? Right. So how like how how much is the feared outcome happening to you? And quickly, and particularly if you have something that is not actually dangerous, people realize, OK, the thing that I am structuring my life around avoiding, it's not actually very probable. So I'm expending a huge amount of energy avoiding something that actually is relatively safe. And so maybe I can mm -hmm. drop some of that avoidance behavior and put that energy to living the life that I want to live and just cope with the fact that, okay, I'm, you may never love spiders, Derek, I got to tell you, <laughs> you may never feel excited to see one. Catherine <laughs> had a <laughs> radical switch, but, but you, you learn to respond to the feelings that you have about the spiders in a different way by learning new experiences, learning new information. But it sounds like entomology might be a career I'd want to follow based on what I'm hearing here. Um, yeah. So we have uh, a few questions have come in from alumni, but before we get to them, let me just go back to you, Catherine. I'm just curious, since we have you, uh, and, and I'm sort of trying to go through this journey uh, here with, with both of you today, you seem fascinated by spiders. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the research you do in the field and why you find spiders such fascinating creatures? And I think as you talk, I think we do have a few uh, pictures of you actually in the field uh, with some of these spiders that we can put up on the screen to show our viewers. But so what is the life of a, um, uh, you know, a spider scientist entail? So most of my, my research, like my master's degree and my, and my uh, PhD research were on black widows. Cause as soon as I started working with them, I, I fell in love with them and wanted to, to understand more about them, to learn about their behavior and their communication system. So I spent uh, several years doing field work in coastal BC uh, with black widow spiders and trying to understand their uh, mating behavior, how males find females in a very large and, and complex world when they're very tiny. Um, they're essentially blind, like they have eyes, but they have very poor vision. So they have to navigate the world largely by their senses of smell and touch, which is really fascinating to me. They have this whole different sensory world than we do. And so um, I sort of, I, I put myself into the spider's shoes and tried to understand how they use uh, chemicals. They, they're essentially the females put uh, chemical compounds on their web that act like a personal ad. So through the, the chemical compounds that they emit, uh, males can detect them from up to 50 meters away, which is, you know, incredible. Imagine being able to smell another human from sort of kilometers distant and then being able to navigate directly to them and and it's not just telling them about their location but also telling the male things like whether or not the female has mated before uh her age and whether or not she's hungry which is really important for male black widows because they risk being being eaten by the female uh, but in addition to my work uh as a sort of behavioral ecologist understanding spider behavior and communication uh, I also do a lot of work that is associated with um, education and outreach. So one of my projects is called Recluse or Not. So that's actually a community science project that involves uh, having 
members of the public submit photos of spiders usually, and, and this came about because people are really concerned about brown recluses in North America. They're one of the two kinds of spiders um, that are considered medically con significant in North America. I will note quickly that we don't have them in Canada, um, but uh, people are people are concerned when they see a brown spider, they don't have the information. Spiders are very difficult to identify um, just by looking at them. So, so they see a brown spider, they want to know, is this a dangerous brown spider? They can send it to me and my colleagues. They send a photo, we identify it for them and tell them, no, this is a harmless house spider. You don't need to worry about it. Or yes, this is a brown recluse. Here's the information you need uh, if you find these spiders in your home. Don't mm -hmm. panic, but you know, here, here's the, the information. And uh, so that's actually a research project as well that's helping us understand when people send in brown recluses from places we don't expect them to be about the range of this spider in, in North America. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that, that kind of online um, community engagement and education and outreach is actually what led to the collaboration uh, on the spiders in the news study that, that we wow. started on. Okay, and I think you have a, a, a spider friend with you on who's about to join the panel, I think if you wanted to show us, right? Oh yeah, sure. I will, I will see if she wants to come out and say hello. Um, and what and is her name? She actually doesn't have a name yet, which is embarrassing. Okay, I'm glad um, to hear that. And I'm calling her she, but I don't know what her sex is because she's not an adult yet. And uh, so she's just two. So this is an example of how two spiders, if there's a spider walking on you, you know, you're just the ground to them. This spider can't see. She she doesn't, um, I mean, she has eyes. She can sort of see light and dark, but she doesn't have image forming eyes like we do. So she's raising her, her legs, kind of trying to figure out where she is. Why has she been airlifted out of her home by a giant? Um, and she's just kind of going for a little walk and I'm in the ground. She has no reason to bite me. Wow. And that is obviously a tarantula. Yes, this is a, a tarantula. <laughs> Um, and she's she's a baby still, and I'm calling her she because I tend to default to to female for spiders. But we won't know until she uh, is an adult. She or he, we won't know until they are an adult. Um, the sex because they don't develop the uh, secondary sex characters necessary to uh, determine that until uh, until their final kind of molt to maturity. Wow. All right. Well, well ni 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 nice to meet you. <laughs> so um, let me turn to some of the questions that have come in from, from alumni. We received a few here. I guess the first one I'll turn to you, Professor Weinberg. It came to us from Barbara. She's writing, she's, she wants to know how effective is knowledge and education in addressing phobias? Is it, is it, oh, sorry, is it irrational that the only effective treatment is exposure? Is it irrational that the yeah. only ex is it so irrational that the only effective treatment is exposure? Um, well, I mean, information is a form of exposure, right? So, so you know, we, if we think about what are the things that um, that keep us fearing spiders, it is that the things that we have learned about them are, you know, are essentially that they are dangerous, or that at least that we are overvaluing uh, the information that has told us previously that they are dangerous. So, uh, information gets you part of the way there, but um, you know, most phobias cannot be stricted, cannot be treated strictly through like a cognitive approach, which is what you know information and psychoeducation would be. Um, so most of the time, because that avoidance is so deeply ingrained behaviorally that you have to start addressing that that behavioral avoidance as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so you, you need to intervene and do these behavioral experiments in order to stop people from engaging in the avoidance. Because if they just, if they know they're not dangerous, but they're like, I'm just going to, you know, again, structure my whole life so that I'm avoiding spiders, then, then you have not really treated the problem. Right. But, but again, like there is a distinction between fear and phobia. So a lot of people have fear. And again, fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Although, you know, perhaps, um, <laughs> perhaps we've maligned spiders too much. You have me kind of convinced Catherine. Um, so information could be a good thing for helping us evaluate our fears. Typically, that alone is not enough to, to treat a phobia. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a, another question for you, Professor Weinberger. came to us from Mark. Um, he wants to know what areas of the brain are activated upon viewing pictures of spiders? Um, and is it the same level of activation triggered upon viewing pictures of other bugs or insects? 
Mm, that's a really good question, actually. And I was I was thinking about that. I was trying to find research that had compared uh, perceptually similar stimuli to spiders. So like looking at crabs. Um, so crabs give people the willies, but they're, people don't typically have a lot of phobias of, of mm-hmm. crabs. Um, so, okay, so to back up to the first part of the question, um, so lots of different regions of the brain are activated when you're looking at pictures of spiders. Um, so people are typically looking at areas of the brain like the amygdala, which are these kind of um, almond-shaped uh, regions of the brain that, that are part of the brain's limbic system. So kind of a, a deep part of the brain, not part of the, the more recently developed cortex. And the amygdala does a lot of different things. One of the things that it does is fear learning and fear detection, right? So so the amygdala is activated when we are looking at things in the environment that are particularly salient. And so threat is almost always particularly salient. So you see increases in activation of the amygdala um, when you're looking at um, pictures of spiders or other kind of threatening stimuli. Um, Depending on the level of fear that people experience, you might also see activation in other regions of the brain. So uh, the bed nucleus of the striata terminalis is also involved particularly in uh, the development of anxiety around um, around, uh, phobic stimuli and also in maintaining phobias um, and and, and threat detection. Uh, And then you also, you know, you see uh, areas of the frontal and prefrontal cortex um, being activated as well. And and those regions of the brain, again, do many, many things, but one of the things that they do is communicate with these limbic systems. So they communicate with the amygdala. And so you have kind of a crosstalk where the amygdala is saying, this is put crudely, but the amygdala is saying like, you know, danger, something really bad is in the environment. And then these frontal regions may be kind of evaluating the veracity of that statement. So how much do I need to attend to that signal? And so the amygdala might ramp up the signaling being like, no, 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 it's, this is like, this is real. There's really like a spider on my knee. And um, that those frontal regions can either, you know, activate other regions of the brain that allow you to jump up, run away screaming, or they can dampen down the signal and say, okay, you know what, like we can handle this. And there is actually some evidence that if you look at what's going on in the brain, when you do an exposure therapy, it's what not necessarily that amygdala response changes. Like people still have this initial like the response to the spiders, but what changes is how you cope with that feeling. So you're yeah. seeing increased strength in the signal from the prefrontal regions to help people yeah. regulate that fear response. Mm-hmm. As you're talking, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking back to the study that Catherine was involved in, I guess the, 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 the other fear that I'm equating the most with this is probably some like fear of flying. Right. Mm. Because, you know, you know, there's that sort of saying that you have a much higher chance of dying, you know, in a car on the drive to the airport than actually in the in the in the plane itself. But yet, you know, you don't see news articles every time a plane lands safely. And yet every time there's a crash that obviously makes headlines and is repeatedly in the news over and over. So I guess, Catherine, I mean, from from the spider scientist perspective, there would be some parallels between this or irrational fear of spiders and and people who are perhaps, you know, have a phobia around flying. Definitely. Yeah. And the the same thing, like sharks come to mind where, you know, um, the, the, we, as humans, we aren't good at evaluating risk in a, in a rational way. I think like, yeah, you're much more likely to die in a car crash than from a spider bite or from a plane crash. Um, Every time, not every time, I don't know that for sure, but a lot of the articles that we saw were were not about spider bites or or adverse consequences um, from spider bites. A lot of the time there was no evidence that a spider bite had even occurred. There's a whole nother story about misdiagnoses of spider bites that I won't get into because spiders Mm -hmm. don't bite people very often. Um, But a lot of articles in our database, and you see these in the news, probably a couple of per year, even in Canada, are someone found a spider in their bag of grapes and nothing happened, but that's news, you know, that gets reported because, you know, we think, oh, that was a, you know, near escape. They found a a black widow in their grapes and they could have died, but they didn't. You're much more likely to die choking on a grape than you are to be bitten by a black widow spider. Um, But we're not, I mean, you should be worried about feeding grapes to your small children because they are a choking hazard, but like, that's not something that we go around being afraid of and and having a hard time living our lives. Um, So 
yeah, I think it's a, a matter of kind of risk assessment and the things that that we notice and that we're primed to um, to care about and to be to be afraid of. Right. And now I'm afraid of grapes. Thank you for that. <laughs> so another question for you, Catherine. Uh, this just came in from Irene. I guess it's directly for you. Um, so she says that she got a bite from a yellow sack spider and her whole hand looked shockingly bruised. The doctor said there are no venomous spiders in Canada. Is this true? And if so, what happened to her? So, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, that you had an injury associated with a spider. And I assume if, if you know it was a yellow sack spider, you, you might have actually seen it bite you. Um, it does happen. Spider bites are rare, I always say to people, but, but they do happen sometimes. And yellow sp sack spider bites are more frequent than most others because yellow sack spiders are really common in homes. So we encounter them more often. And so, you know, sometimes people get bitten because they roll over on one in their sleep. And often the reason they know they were bitten by a spider is because there's a crushed spider in their bed. Um, yellow sack spiders do have venom, like, like the vast majority of spiders. It is for um, paralyzing insects. It's not for biting humans because they don't feed on us. They don't feed on our blood or anything like that. So essentially spider bites are accidental happenings that are, are caused by you putting in the spider putting the spider in a situation where its life is threatened and it's biting defensively. Um, I think that, so the doctor is correct. I'm glad that your doctor told you that there aren't um, medically important spiders in Canada. Um, we don't have brown recluses, uh, which could cause uh, necrosis, um, which uh, is um, similar to uh, flesh eating disease, um, but that's very commonly misdiagnosed. So people unfortunately are often in Canada where these spiders don't exist, uh, diagnosed with brown recluse spider bites, or the people are told that it might've been a brown recluse spider bite, but it's very hard to get at by differential diagnosis. You often don't have any evidence. And so the doctor might say, well, the symptoms are consistent with A, B, C, D, and E. One of those might've been a spider bite. And then people go home with that story. And that tends to stick in their mind that it mm. might've been a spider bite as opposed to a bacterial infection. Um, most times it's a bacterial infection and it's uh, treated with antibiotics and then the person gets better. Um, I don't know in, in the person who asked the questions case, um, I assume you got better. I hope it wasn't too, too bad. And um, maybe the antibiotics were involved. If so, it might've been a secondary infection of the bite. You know, anytime your skin is broken, you can get bacteria, things can get in there and, and cause adverse effects. People can also have um, allergic reactions or unusual reactions to spider bites occasionally. And mm -hmm. the fact is we don't actually have a lot of good data on spider bite symptoms because people don't very often get bitten by spiders. They don't often get um, seen by medical professionals when they do, because usually the symptoms aren't that bad and, and they're just fine. Um, so hopefully I answered your question, but, um, I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk about these things more and, and you can get in touch with me afterwards, uh, if you'd like to. Yeah. Or likewise, Irene, you can send us a follow-up email and we can get it over to Catherine for sure. Um, so we, I guess we have time for one more question that, um, that has come in. In fact, it's funny because I was going to ask you this exact question, Catherine, um, the question is, what should we do uh, when we find spiders in our home? Um, should we leave them there or is it better to escort them outdoors? So, I mean, this is a matter of personal pre preference and I don't want to shame anyone who doesn't like having spiders in their home. That's fine. Um, I will say spiders are good neighbors. Spiders have, have a role to play in, in every ecosystem in which they're found, including in our gardens and in our homes. So if there are spiders in your house, it's because there is something for them to eat in your house. So they're eating flies uh, and other insects that you might not like to have around. So if you don't mind having that spider web in the corner and you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Um, you know, you can live in, in relative harmony. Um, if it doesn't bother you, leave the spiders to do their thing. They're there because there's food for them to eat. And so they're doing their job controlling the uh, insect populations in your house. But if you'd rather not have them, when you do encounter them, uh, you can do the old cup and card technique, you know, where you take take a, a drinking glass, put it over the spider, slide a postcard or, or stiff um, piece of paper underneath, 
and carry them outside. Most of the spiders that we find in our houses are also find, found kind of around homes. So they'll probably mm -hmm. find a place to live outside your house or in the shed or something like that if, if they're not inside. Um, it's it's up to you either way. Um, mm -hmm. But but just it's important to be aware that, that they do have um, a role to play in in the food web in terms of being a predator of insects and other spiders. And then also they're important to have in your garden, um, both as pest control and as food for other animals like birds. You know, if you like birds, spiders are food for birds. So they're, they're playing an important role. All right. Um, so we just got one more. We'll try to squeeze one more question in before we, before we end. I guess this will be for you, Catherine, as well. It came to us from Michelle. Um, she's asking, she says, since there's a tendency for sensationalism, what are some good resources for learning more about spiders? Oh, you can plug the Lyman Laboratory if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. Um, you, can, you can get in touch with your um, local museum or, or in, insect collection like the Lyman. Um, you can look at my blog. Um, I, it's called Spider Bites, but it's uh, spider B-Y-T-E-S, like information. Um, the American Arachnological Society has a great website um, with lots of resources and the British Arachnological Society as well. Um, both are quite active online. If you Google them, um, the British Arachnological Society is really good, has lots of um, fact sheets about common spiders and things like that. Um, there are often also, you know, you can join your local natural history club um, and uh, and you know be around other people who who like wildlife and um get a field guide to to the spiders of there are a couple that are good for eastern north america there there isn't one specific to quebec or even eastern canada but there are there are lots of general books about spiders for north america um, and that's also a good place to start is sort of um when you see a spider either you know look at your field guide or go online, um, bug guide as well, or iNaturalist is another good, good way to, um, when you take see a spider, take a picture of it, upload it to iNaturalist, find out what it is, and then you know, you've know you learned something about it, then you can go and look up that species and, and find out a little more information about it wow. as well. Okay, wonderful, great, very, very helpful. So Professor Weinberg, maybe just one final question for you as we wrap up. I still haven't figured out yet if I'm, more afraid or less afraid of spiders after this. I mean, I'll have to go back and rewatch this maybe a couple more times, but any last minute advice for, for me or for fellow arachnophobes out there now that we know that our world is full of spiders, our homes are full of spiders. Um, any, any advice on sort of learning how to accept them as harmless housemates from a psychological perspective? <laughs> Oh, I, well, yeah, with the, with the two minutes that we have left. Um, so, I mean, I guess that the question, the best brief advice I can give is to ask yourself, what's the alternative? Mm. Right. So, so if you live in a world full of spiders, your home is full of spiders. What is the alternative to trying to accept that? Um, and if you can't, so if the alternative is to burn the house down and, you know, go live in a hermetically sealed biodome or something like that, then, you know, Think about whether that's the life that you want to live, if that's consistent with your values. If it is, like, it's not my, you know, go ahead and do it. You have my support. If that's the life that you want to live. <laughs> if that's not the life you want to live, you know, then then I suggest trying to start with some low-level exposures and, and, and see how that works for you. Um, but, but you know, the motivation has to be there. Uh, and so it's really a question that, that everyone has to ask themselves is, is how much, how important it is to them to cope with reality, essentially. Right. Well, now that you've laid it out so so squarely, I think it's uh, going to be a little bit, little bit easier for me so, <laughs> to figure that one out. Um, so that uh, just about wraps up the time we do have today. Uh, before we bring this webcast to a close, I would like to remind you that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So do feel free to share it with others who may not have been in, able to tune in live. I would, of course, like to extend my deep gratitude to our two guests, Professor Anna Weinberg, Associate Professor of Psychology, and Catherine Scott, Postdoctoral Fellow at McGill's Lyman Laboratory, for joining me today and helping me confront my arachnophobia. 
in spite of my initial trepidation, I did find this to be a fascinating and illuminating discussion and, and something I'll, I'll probably think about for, for a while still. And thank you, of course, to all our courageous souls out there who tuned in today and joined me on this journey. Please continue to stay tuned to your McGill email and social media feeds over the coming weeks as we continue to share news about exciting online and in-person programming, including holiday parties in many communities across Canada and around the world, as well as future episodes of this Made by McGill alumni webcast series. We will be back in December with one final episode before we break for the holidays. Uh, and you never know what scary topic we might address next. Until then, please be well and stay safe. Thank you.